Welcome to episode 10 of the Setting Trick Podcast. Today I'm excited to welcome Jeopardy champion James Holzhauer onto the show. James is somebody who recently appeared on the cover of the ACBL Bridge Bulletin, and I saw him at the Las Vegas North American Bridge Championships in July. Um, it's exciting to have a dynamic games player like James in the bridge world. He, he really did some unique things with Jeopardy. What, what I really admire about James is his tenacity and his per- perseverance. Um, James tried out for Je- Je- Jeopardy multiple times before getting onto the show. And when he got on the show, he really took it as an opportunity to, to flex, like, not flex, but like really like use his trivia knowledge to really take down a big score. James, uh, it's, it's a pleasure to have you on the uh, show. Um, my grandmother um, watched Jeopardy every day, and I know that you... Uh, I read that you um, that you promised your grandmother that you would be on Jeopardy one day, and uh, my first question is: Did did your grandmother happen to play bridge? I'm sorry. Oh, she she did not play bridge. Um, you know, I I really taught myself the game when I was I want to say 14 or 15, just kind of on a lark. You know, I was bored and uh, decided this is a a game that's. I know drew in kind of intellectuals from all over the place, and you know I thought it might be fun. So I, I, I would not say I learned to play the game even decently for another at least ten years beyond that. But yeah, that was the, the first start I got was just as a teenager. And 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 you said you learned to play as a fourteen-year-old. What uh, what? How did you get exposed? How did you get exposed to bridge? Um, so you know I would play a little bit on I think it was Yahoo back in the day they used to host these games they were not of a high caliber shall we say um, but you know it was, it was enough to get me interested and so I I bought um, Watson's book on play on the hand and I think Goren's bridge complete those were my first two uh, things and I really kind of developed an interest in bridge books that to this day I probably have a couple hundred on my shelf the, the wife constantly complains that we don't need more of them but you know they're there's something I find interesting. Um, and, and do you, with all these bridge books, um, is there, like, you really revolutionized Jeopardy in a way, but, well, what I love, maybe that's the wrong word, but you, what I love about what you did on Jeopardy is that you, you, you gravitated towards uh, something that you, could, that you could relate to with the, the children's books and that engrossed you. Do you have the, the same relationship with all of these bridge books? Uh, I will say that in general, um, nonfiction books that are aimed at adults, I handle a lot better than fiction. Uh, you know, Jeopardy tends to ask more about kind of the literature canon, uh, you know, Shakespeare, Dickens, Twain, these things. Oh, Twain is more accessible for younger minds. But yeah, it's, you know, kind of really, uh, I, I don't know what to say, you know, that it's a slog to get through for people like me. But I think that's um, things like bridge books, they flow a lot better, especially if it's, you know, even uh, bridge fiction, like the Victor Molo Menagerie series, um, some of my all-time favorite books. And do you can you remember a specific instance where, like a chi- where like you had a child uh, a children's book clue that you got right on Jeopardy? Uh, well, there there were some that are explicitly about books that are designed for eight year olds. But you know what I did a lot of is uh, they had this old series called Classics Illustrated that would kind of turn uh, classic works of fiction into a short digestible comic book that was aimed at, I don't know, maybe a tween uh, reader. But I found this, you know, much easier to go through than to actually go get a copy of, I don't know, David Copperfield and read through that. You know, this I could breeze through in 20 minutes, pick up all the key elements of the, the book, you know, know the characters. And I think having the illustrations helps kind of make it stick visually. Um, and, you know, like for subjects like history and presidents, you know, science, things like that, most of the, the stuff they ask about on the show really can be boiled down to things that are aimed at a young mind. And, you know, I find it much easier to go to the, I don't know, juvenile section of the library, pick up a book on the presidents and read through that rather than, I don't know, an encyclopedia or something mm. to that level. 
Mm. So what's your what? How, how are you engaged with Bridge um, today? Like, are you doing? I mean, the Jeopardy preparation sounds comprehensive. Is like, what what is your regular like? How, yeah. Well, in a way, there was very fortuitous timing because this aired right before they had the NABC in Las Vegas right here. And, you know, normally if I go to an NABC, it'll only be for a few days, uh, you know, because I got to get back home, send everything here. But since this one was in town, I was able to attend almost every day of it, meet uh, a lot of the big personalities, you know, uh, probably at least half of bridge players are Jeopardy fans. So, I, you know, it was funny. I'm going out there and Jeff Mexpeth is walking up to me to introduce himself. You know, it was amazing. <laughs> So he and I are uh, corresponding a little bit via email now. He's giving me some advice to get me started, which is, you know, amazing of him. Um, yeah, I've uh, worked up some personal contacts with a lot of the pros here in town. Uh, Fred Gittleman has been really nice. Josh Dunn. Uh, yeah, I got together to play with them. Bobby Levin, too. Uh, I got to play with Bobby's stepson, Shane Blanchard, at the Nationals. And we put up a great score in one of the open events, you know. I So I would say that... For the most part, I was treading water at the NABC events this July, but you know, to, to do that in an open field at a national is just an amazing feeling for me. Um, I know I have a lot of room to grow, but you know, now I have people who are willing to help me get there, so that's kind of incredible. Yeah, we I played in that event uh, that you played with Shane. The uh, I think it was the Werners, and I saw you were I saw you were in eighth place after the first day. I was like, wow, that's uh, that's pretty impressive. <laughs> Yeah, Shane, uh, a good, at least 80% of the credit to Shane for that, but uh, no, it was, a, it was a good experience for sure. Um, well, I actually, I asked, I asked Shane about it, and uh, he, was, he was complimentary. I actually have some quotes here from, uh, from Shane if you want to, <laughs> okay. if, if you want to hear them. Are you, are you, are you interested in, uh, in what Shane has to say? Oh, I'm sure their listeners are going to love this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is from Shane. This is through Michael Zhu, my intern. So, um, We played pretty basic two over one, strong no trump, Bergen raises, and semi-forcing one no trump. Not sure, many, not many gadgets. I'm not sure if we even played two-way checkback. Do you, do you play two-way checkback? I, I usually prefer one way just because it's simple. You know what the thing is, like, uh, I'm sorry about the sound of that Coke can opening on your audio there. Uh, you know, a lot of my bidding practice is with Gib online, and mm. I, 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 I tend to prefer the convention. Gib is not good at bidding, don't get me wrong, but uh, I tend to prefer the conventions that I at least have practice working on there. Um, I, I don't know. I just think it leads to fewer misunderstandings. I know my, my regular partner back in Illinois before I moved out to Vegas liked to play XYZ and we would have some misunderstandings mm. about whether it was on over interference and things like that. Right. I don't, think, I, I don't know. It's, I, I, I think that a lot of these things for a player of my level are just, you know, it's, it's introducing confusion for minimal gain. Well, I have more. He, 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 he puts you at between a three and four on Bridgemaster for card play. Are you familiar with the Bridgemaster on uh, yes. BBO? Sure. Um, and then Aaron Jones, another friend of mine, said you would recognize a double squeeze. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sure. That's, a, that's an interesting <laughs> way to pinpoint the, uh, the card play level. Well, I, yeah, I mean, I, I thought that, uh, yeah, I mean, I... I I mean, I, I don't even know if I've ever executed a double squeeze at the table. Have you? Uh, yeah, I, I did. I mean, you know, a lot of times you just pull them off by accident, right? Yeah. And, uh... <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I also, I, I thought, I, well, I thought that was, I don't know. I, I thought that was like a nice, like, having shared what Shane, what Shane um, told Michael. So I wanted to give you, I wanted to fluff you up there with the uh, double squeeze compliment, but, sure. but it sounds like you're, you're, sounds like you're nonplussed. You seem nonplussed by that. <laughs> you're like, of course I could execute. I don't know. You just didn't anyway. Um, yeah. So how are you, how are you, are, are you playing? Like, do you, are you playing regularly? You're playing uh, online? Yeah, I mean, or? I'm trying to get out there. You know, one, the one problem now is it's football season and uh, Jeopardy's tournament of champions is, you know, going around now, so there's there's been a lot of time devoted to both gambling and studying, and also you know I'm a stay at home parent, so I I can't switch that off mm. you know, just to to go play bridge for four hours. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I try to get to the clubs as often as I can. You know, uh, 
I, I don't know, Josh, Josh Don's daughter and my daughter are now best friends. Uh, so maybe one of these days we'll organize a uh, time where they can have a play date together and we can go to the, the club. I did play with uh, Josh this past week at uh, Las Vegas Bridge World. It was a good experience, I think, for me anyway. <laughs> He's, he seemed like he didn't uh, hate it too much either. And what's Las Vegas uh, Bridge World? Oh, it's just uh, you know a club out here. Actually, uh, Josh's mom helps run it, and that's that's why we we chose that particular game to go to. Uh, but yeah, it's just a you know daily club game. Mm. Did you win? We scored, I think, a fifty-four percent, but we managed to win East-West with that, which you know I've never done that before. <laughs> mm. Mm. Yeah, I know Josh's. I know I knew Josh's mom was out. And I you know I don't know if you knew. I made a documentary movie about Bridge. Um, it's called Double Dummy, and I'll send okay. you. I'll send you a. Uh, I'll send you a link where you can watch it uh, um, when we're done. Um, because I, because I want more young people. I want more young people playing bridge. Well, so, so don't, don't we all? <laughs> <laughs> so that's I, why I really it's exciting for me to to like that you're out there. You know, like you're you're you you know you captured the imagination of a of a good percentage of our country with your with your run on jeopardy and uh, i think just it's just so exciting to to see you at the nabc i didn't come up and introduce myself um which i now regret um but uh i saw on facebook uh people taking photos with you um what's that like what's your uh what is how would you describe your level of celebrity it's uh interesting because it's you know, a, a fair level of celebrity, but it's also with a, a very specific segment of the population. Um, so I would say, like, especially at the, at the bridge convention, you know, so many of these bridge people are in the, the same kind of Jeopardy demographic that, you know, it, it was everyone there wanted to say hi, you know, okay, mm. no, no problem. Now, uh, you know, some, sometimes when I'm out with my daughter around town, she doesn't like the uh, the attention and she's been known to do things like uh, she'll take her little kid fork if we're out at lunch and someone comes up to our table, she'll take her kid fork and try to stab the person and hope they get the, uh, the hint to go away. Um, but luckily, you know, a lot of the time when I'm out, her functions like this, she's not around. And it's, you know, if it's not bothering the family it doesn't bother me really um but yeah i would say that you know i also spent a lot of my time around las vegas so you know i think the more people were paying attention to what was going on on jeopardy out here because they had their hometown guy on but mm. i will say i also took vacations to several different countries in europe over the summer and, and there were i assume they were american tourists but i got recognized in every country <laughs> Is it like you do you hear somebody talking about you like what's like that you overhear something or like you see them pointing like what's uh what's no, usually of... usually they're, they're more blunt about it they'll shout Jeopardy James as I walk by or something like that <laughs> sometimes you'll hear people uh murmuring one time I remember a couple of girls I don't know they were probably 15 or so like uh kind of gasping at each other and they were saying like you talk to him no you talk to him <laughs> You know, I was with my kids, so I didn't want to engage them, but I kind of wanted to, like, uh, give them a little crash course on playing it cooler than that. <laughs> well, I saw you. I saw you on a couple Bridge Playing Friends uh, Facebook feeds. Um, Jory Grosak, uh, for example, she's the mother of Adam and Zach Grosak, who are in the movie, and she had you on uh, on her Facebook and, and, a, and a couple other a couple other Bridge players. And I, I think when I was thinking about this question, it came up because every time I would type your name into uh, my Gmail, it would autocomplete your name. Hmm. So I think that's like, that's a true, like that's, the, that's for me, like that's the kind of the tipping point that you've reached this point where Gmail knows that, I'm, that I want to spell your last name. <laughs> wow. It's, it's kind of crazy how the computers are... Uh picking up on our, our thoughts i think they uh they must be just listening when we're we're not paying attention mm. do you use like what type of uh, what type of uh, automation do you use for uh for your sports for your sports betting uh i don't know that i would call it automation you know i i'm not a programmer by nature so i just run all my simulations in excel really and you know a lot of it is kind of just done by feel you um i I would say a large portion of my profit now comes from things like in-game betting and halftime betting where you don't necessarily have time to run a new simulation just during every commercial break, but you can 
you know, kind of mentally adjust for how the game has gone so far. And, you know, if you, if you have a mind that works like mine, you can say, like, oh, they're, they're saying that this team added 10% to their win expectancy, but really it should be more like 7 You know, I'm going to mm. go bet the other side. Mm. I think that the sometimes the perception of how much the momentum has swung in the game is uh, too strong. So, I'll, like, if a team's going on a great drive, I'll often bet against them, actually, because they, they adjust too far. Mm. Hmm. So you... This is uh, more of a bias that you can find in sports like football than in baseball. In baseball, it tends to be more just like, okay, you know, the half innings over, the team scored one run, we'll, we'll move the odds, what the computer says. Mm. But they, they try to put more emotion into it in football, and that's where they mess up. So what's your setup? Do you have, like, uh, a bunch of screens so you can watch all the NFL games at once? Uh, you know, for NFL, I do, but I, I don't. it's not so much that I'm, like... I usually don't do this in-game stuff when there's 10 games on because it's impossible to follow that many at once. So mm. I will, and, and you know, I, I, have, I live in a, a family household, so we only have one TV here, but I'll usually go to like a sports bar on Sunday morning and run all the games there just, you know, to watch as a fan more than anything, but also to, you know, make sure I don't miss it if a quarterback gets injured or something important like that happens. Hmm. I used to do I used to do that in game betting uh, through uh, World Sports Exchange. Is it is it uh, is it legal to do? Uh, they have um, they have places in town now that that offer this service. Um, like usually during commercial breaks, uh, most of the major sports books in town you, you can bet uh, from remotely via the apps now. This has totally revolutionized the industry over the past few years. Um, but yeah, you uh, you know can can do this during every commercial break, and they uh, it it's there's nothing illegal about it. Mm. But yeah, I know World Sports Exchange. They uh, they went under and took a lot of people's money with them, including mine. So that's yeah, that was a bad memory. Mm. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, well, I hear you. I hear you saying that uh, like you could bet. At a kiosk during a commercial, it seems like I, I have. I... It's not. It's not even a kiosk. It's just on your phone. You uh, you download an app to your phone. Oh, okay. Gotcha. And is is like. Uh, um, are there bridge applications for like? How do you do? You see like, like? Can you give me an example of how like what you're talking about with football to feel like in bridge? Uh, I don't know. It'd be tough to say. You know, table feel is one of my my worst aspects because I play so much of the uh, bridge I play is just with robots online. Who obviously this is not a factor with them. Uh, I, and yeah, I would say that you know it's you know one sports betting concept that's well maybe it's more of a poker concept that uh, applies to bridge is like the idea that you you want to give your do things that give you two ways to win. Um. um you know, so you, you if you let's say you have a borderline hand at a competitive auction, you might just raise the game because you know you can either make the game or you can drive them to an unprofitable sacrifice when you might you know your hand might be worth three hearts, but you bid four to you know put the opponents to a guess. That's definitely something that happens in poker. Also, I guess um, in in sports too, you sometimes like can. Especially towards the end of a football game, you might say, "Okay, this is how I see the game playing out." But you know, it's not obviously it's not guaranteed to go exactly that way. You you know you you want to have more than one way of winning. Can you think of a specific hand from uh, from playing with Shane, for example, at the, in the in the Werner pairs where you did uh, where you did well, like with with something like that? Um, I, w I guess I could I, I could give Shane the credit. So we had driven to an auction. Uh, where I think I had like six spades of the ace queen. Um, let's decide ace. I don't remember. No, I said uh, side king queen, fourth of clubs. Maybe a king double ten. At any rate, you know, I found him with uh, with all the missing key cards. So I bid seven spades, and he he went into the, what we call the tank in poker, you know, <laughs> for a few minutes, and eventually. Uh, shot out a seven no trump because he thought that you know either the fourth club with be good or you know there was other possibilities and you know like i don't i don't know how much of this field was getting this seven level contract anyway but he really thought that we were 
you know, well over like a two to one favorite, say to make seven no if seven spades was on. Mm. So I thought that was a really, uh, really good bid by him. Um. Oh, well, you know, what about uh, what about uh, like when you started out young? Did you have any? Uh, did you went like who was your first bridge mentor? Uh, I don't know that I've ever had a bridge mentor up until now. You know, I mean, I would play with my friends at school, but none of us were uh, serious enough about getting good at it. So yeah, that, that's 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 been a thing that I've been missing really on in my education is. I haven't had anyone who's uh, been willing to kind of try to take me to the level I would I would like to get to. Except Jeff Maxtroth. Well, yeah, okay. Now, now I do. I <laughs> say it hasn't been there before. If I, if I didn't make that clear, but yeah, now now I have all kinds of people willing to <laughs> offer their time to me, which I think is amazing. Is there anything uh, like sp- specific that you could share that you would feel comfortable sharing about uh, about uh, like what Mac has shared has 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 uh, said to you about uh, about the game? Uh, you know what I think is funny is he was, uh, we, were, we were corresponding a little bit. He was talking, I don't know, I was giving him some betting tips. He was giving me some general bridge tips. But then all of a sudden he started uh, just sending me daily updates for how much Assey and Rodwell were kicking at the <laughs> <laughs> world championships. Yeah, they won the, they, they had the highest butler. Yeah. Um, yeah, um, so I try, I looked you up on uh, the website uh, Bridge Ratings, the Power Ratings website, and unfortunately you didn't you did not uh, you did not show up there. Um, how many? <laughs> okay. Do, are you familiar with the 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 Colorado Springs Bridge Rating, the Power Ratings website? No. They 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 like the reason I bring this up is because they have this. Uh, it's this guy Chris Champion, and he's trying to like Master Points, for example. <laughs> I th- I think Michael said that you're you're not a life master. No, I uh, I think I like the silver points. There might be some other thing, but this, I definitely am well short on silver. So when you're not a, when you like basically the the idea is that master points are a poor um, a poor determinant of one's true skill. So this guy has gone about rating players um, based on their results. And each game, for example, like uh, the Werner pairs would get like, like the, there's a, it's assigned a degree of difficulty. So the Werner pairs would be like probably 10 points in, or even higher than a club. Like if you scored a 50 in the Werner pairs, it'd be like worth scoring a 60 at a club, for example. Sure, it makes sense. Um, so I, I try to look you up on there to see, and you, uh, unfortunately, you're not in there. Right. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I don't have that much experience playing, so I don't, uh, yeah, you know, hopefully I'll get there. I, I, I've thought that it might make sense for me to quit sports betting at the end of this football season, and, you know, that will free up an enormous amount of time for me to really pursue this if I decide to go that route. Wow. Wow. You're thinking about quitting sports betting. Well, you know, it's... I, not to delve too much into the personal life, but you know, it's a, it's a really a grind, especially when during this time of year when all the things are going. You know, hockey is starting now. I, uh, I, I used to never bet on hockey, but then I, I, I made the mistake of finding a, a system that I think is you know, nicely profitable, and now I, I feel compelled to work during this time. You know, I, I like I kind of like the dopamine hit from winning, and I think it's you know, <laughs> if, I, if I can get that from bridge instead of from gambling, that's probably better overall for me. So. Um, what's a what is a like how you you said in the in the article in the bridge in the bridge bulletin that you that you aspired to being a world class player? Yeah, I uh, you know I really it's it's ambitious I know, but I think that's that's the level I could get to if I really put my head into it. And I one one thing about me is I never half ass anything. So you know if I if I decide to go this route, it will be you know mm. with with the intent of getting to that tip top level at some point. Gosh, the, I mean, the, the bridge world, like it would, I, I, I mean, just for me, for example, I would love to see like what that looks like. Yeah, for me, like, you know, I think a lot of people are just thrilled to, to get to go on Jeopardy at all. But for me, it was like, okay, I have one shot at this, you know, what's, what's the thing I can do to absolutely maximize this one shot I have? 
you know, Bridge Bridge, I guess they have new tournaments every year, so that's uh, it's it keeps recurring. But you know, there's only one life. I don't want to mm. be mediocre at something if I know I can be great at it. Wow. Yeah, that that uh, that exact quote in the article really, um, gosh, it's uh, it's it, it challenges me because I I do have fast things, and that's part of the reason <laughs> yeah. why I was nervous calling you was because like, and like reaching out to you initially because I was like I do half ass things and I like I it it shows, and. Um, I just I just admire that uh, that you have that determination, and we've seen like what can happen with it with Jeopardy, um, like that you spent all this time and it paid off. You know, like you really like I, you, you you on your on the episode where you lost, you didn't answer a question wrong. Like right. that, I mean, you know, like that's just uh, like it would be fascinating to document. Uh, your, 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 like how you're approaching bridge. If you if you really decided that you wanted to, especially at this later, like a, you know, like you're in your, I think you're in your early thirties. I'm thirty five. Yeah. Um. So I mean, do you think it's possible to get to, like, because I'm forty three and it's like I don't know that it's possible that I could ever get to the level. I mean, anything approaching. Uh, uh, Max Strauss, for example. I mean, great, granted, he's one of the greatest players of all time. Yeah, well, I mean, you, you, you're the only one who knows your... If you do have ass things, that's a, probably an extremely uh, problematic trait. Um, but I would say, you know, there's there's a level of natural talent, sure, but just, you know, you're... You know, with enough practice, I think you can get good at processing, like, okay, here's how I visualize the, uh, the unseen hands. You know, you can work through okay i played with this player before i had i know his tendencies you know all this all this stuff okay i'm a you know i'm a two to one favorite for this finesse to work because of xyz factors you know i i think this this stuff is all kind of out there i think it's it's, it's things that can be developed you know well when i i you, I, you were a math prodigy um as a child so uh um it sounds like you do have some. I mean, some real natural. It sounds like you have some natural talent uh, potentially for bridge. Yeah, it's not the most mathematical game in the world, but I definitely think that that sort of stuff helps. You know, you uh, dig into card combinations or you know how how the missing points are going to divide things like that. It's all really boils down to math at some level. Hmm. Huh. So, man, I don't know what to do, man. I don't know what to, uh, where to go. Do you, do you bet on uh, basketball? Uh, basketball? Only a little bit. It's not a, a sport I really specialize in handicapping. Um, you know what I like is the, the NCAA tournament in March that I think is more like uh, a math problem. You know, you kind of, the, by then the market has had time to sort out who the good and bad teams are, but you see like, public money is kind of affecting the odds and uh, offering some value on these propositions of like, you know, which conference is going to win the title or, you know, will, will the ACC teams combine for more over under 14 and a half wins, things like that. I think you can, you can solve mathematically. So I, I like to do that every year. Well, I live in Charlottesville, Virginia, which in case you don't know, is the uh, home of the University of Virginia. That's quite a uh, quite a swing your your team has had in tournament performance the past couple of years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that's fair to say. I mean, we lost in the first round for the first time ever, and then we had the most amazing run to uh, to the championship last year. Yeah, I uh, I know I had um, I bet you guys in the the semifinal game, and I, I could not believe that they fouled us. It was like. Uh, Kyle Guy shooting the three, whoever it was. I can't believe they fouled him uh, in that spot. That was insane. I was at the game. And, oh, nice. And I, I was like, it's over. And the Auburn fans <laughs> yeah. cheered. And I looked down there, and Bruce Pearl, the Auburn coach, is like having a fl- throwing a fit. And I'm like, what's wrong? They won. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm a I'm a U of I guy, and uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Bruce Pearl's history. He uh, like basically sent in a spy to try and catch U of I in recruiting violations. Um, you know, gosh, this must be almost 20 years ago now. We've always uh, hated him for that. Still. Mm. Yeah, they had a they had a legendary team back in the uh, late '80s. Um, Marcus Liberty, those guys. Was that before you were uh, before your time? That, that was kind of before my time. But you know, around the uh, the turn of the century, they won the Big Ten like six out of seven years, something like that. So when I was in school, we were, uh, we were a great program. My senior year is when we lost to North Carolina in the final. Oh wow! Who was on that team? Oh, they had Darren Williams, D. Brown, uh, Luther Head. D, not D Brown, the guy who played for the Celtics for years. No, this is a yeah. There's many many D Browns. This one uh, less lesser known. Mm. Darren Williams, not Darren Williams, who played for the in the NBA, was it? No, that's that's the same one. Yeah. Weren't there two of them? Uh, I maybe I don't I don't know, but this this one was definitely the the one who started in the NBA for several years. Like a light skinned black guy. Yes. Hmm. Um. What what questions should I be asking you that I'm not asking you? I don't know. I don't. I don't really know. Uh, you know, I'll be honest. I had I had not listened to your podcast. I don't know what you ask uh, Chris Thompson and them. But yeah, I mean, you know, I think it, it, I'm not sure I'm gonna ever chronicle my my journey towards you know hopeful bridge startup someday. But it might be an interesting. Thing for people to observe from afar, I guess. Well, you I don't really... know. I guess I can I can put a call out there if anyone else wants to uh, to mentor me. I'm <laughs> certainly open to suggestions. Um, tell us about uh, um, Project 150. Oh sure. Um, you know this is a fantastic organization in the Vegas area. They're working. You know this is a really inhospitable environment for homeless teens. Uh, so I, I think like they're doing amazing work really um, you know they, they you just show up if you have a school ID they no questions asked you can get some clothes you can get food you can um, get you know study help just any everything that a uh, almost person of like high school age would need it's really just you know an incredible place they're uh, really happy that someone is out there publicizing their work and yeah if there any listeners here in the Vegas area or just you know concerned about the, the welfare of future generations you know please think about looking them up sending them some money um you know the thing about this podcast is it's way harder than I like I, I feel like I should be able to have a conversation with you like I love I, I used to bet on sports I worked for a hedge fund I love bridge and it's like uh, it's like stifling trying to like I don't know if it's a persona that I want to play as the host but I'm, I'm trying to listen to what you have to say and uh, it's like uh, man it's 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 hard. Is that uh, what was it like being on the on the show um, for the first time? Well, it got uh, easier over time. I'll tell you that. You know, the first time I, I certainly had tried to prepare myself for the big stage, but it was a, still a little uh, nerve wracking to actually see the set. You know, see Alex Trebek up close, and you know, just kind of remember that you have to play just like you would at home. You know, not lose yourself in the moment. Uh, but yeah, you know, it's but the more familiarity. We just taped the tournament of champions a couple of weeks ago, and you know, I, I as soon as I entered the studio again, I noticed the distinctive smell, and it uh, kind of brought me back. It was uh, kind of funny, and yeah, I think that there, you know, it's definitely a kind of home field advantage that exists when you're used to the, the set and the, the mechanics of the signaling device and things like that. That mm. you know, my my advantage would just grow and grow over time mm. the longer I was on there. Mm. And what about like your first experience with the actual Jeopardy buzzer? Do they give you like the opportunity to practice at all, or do they just throw you out there and like here's the buzzer? They do give you a little bit of practice before taping starts for the day, but it's not a huge amount. Um, yeah, I would I would say like you know if you, it's very common now for people who know they're going to be on the show to build themselves a, a practice device. You know, it can be like a mechanical pencil it was for me, or just a uh, toilet paper roll holder is a popular choice. You know, just 
pick something that gives you some practice before you set out there. Um, and I think that, yeah, that's really a good idea. If, you, if you're stepping in with no, no practice at all, you're not going to really have enough time in this session to get the rhythm of it. So you said you used a mechanical pencil? Yeah, you know what I did. I uh, like I said, I don't have ass anything, so I uh, I tried to do the best job I could of simulating what was actually going to go on there. And I would I took a mechanical pencil and I wrapped a bunch of layers of masking tape around it um, to try to you know the mechanical pencil obviously is thinner than this device is, um, so I would I would try to like you know simulate the the radius of it by doing this. And, uh, yeah, I definitely think that that helps, you know, the part of the problem is you, you don't know, uh, you know, they, so they have this, uh, this person who's, who's clicking a button that when Alex is done reading the question to activate the, the lights and everything and allow people to buzz in and you, you don't know at home what's that person's rhythm is like. And so the, the, the practice session is kind of a way for you to, to work on that, but you don't, again, you know, you don't have a ton of time to, to adjust to this when you're out there. So it's, it's really important to have come at it in advance, I think. So you, you said there's a practice session, uh, and yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's short though. You, you're up there for like maybe five minutes practicing. That's all you get on the actual set. Yes. With the other people. Uh, yeah. I mean, you're, you're up there three at a time, you know, they have like typically, I don't know, 12 people who are in there for any given taping session. And you're, uh, you're up there with, the other people like three at a time playing on the actual podiums and all that mm. <laughs> what did you think of the of the set when you saw it for the first time uh with your own eyes uh i don't know it's uh, you know i've seen plenty of pictures of it uh from home but it's still there's still something about you know catching your first glimpse of it it, was, mm. uh, it, it felt pretty special <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, man. I mean, and, and like, what about the fact, you know, like you had done, like, did it make you, did you feel, did you feel nervous that you had done all this work? And like, what if it just didn't ha help? Or the, did you feel confident because you had done all this pre-work? Uh, I definitely would say I felt more confident than anything else. Um, but, you know, I mean, I, at the same time, I, I know you, you can do all the handicapping in the world, you know, get get your bets down at great odds and just at some factor you never even considered uh, can just come out of nowhere and get you. So I, I, I just really set the goal going in like, hey, I'm going to play my best. That's all I can do. And, you know, I hope I hope for the best outcome I can get. But, you know, if I play my best and that's not enough, that's fine. Just mm -hmm. like, you know, I don't. I don't want to go in there and say, okay, I really didn't really give this my best. I, I blew this opportunity. But anything other than that would have been a fine result, I think. And are you allowed to share with your wife what's happening on the show? Well, she, yeah, I mean, she's you know, going to notice. I <laughs> keep leaving the house to <laughs> take more episodes. So, yeah, they, uh, I, I mean, they tell you not to tell anyone, but I think that practically speaking, they understand your wife has to be, you know, mm. what's going on. She actually uh, was only, I mean, you know, a lot of people have their spouse attend, but we have a four-year-old, and uh, so it was impractical for her to attend most of my shows. She did come to the Tournament of Champions, so it was nice for, uh, for her to be out there. Mm. Does she play bridge? No. She, uh, she, at some point, she declared that she was going to learn the game, and I bought her a beginner book and offered to, you know, go over some basics with her, but it never happened, and I don't think it ever will. She, you know what's funny? We, we play um, games like Euchre or Spades sometimes, and someone will, you know, lay down their hand and claim the rest of the tricks, and she hates that. It's like, the, I, I, it's hard for me to think of something she hates more in the world than that, and it's, uh, you know, just impossible to play bridge without that happening, so I don't know how we're going to get around that. <laughs> Yeah, that sounds like a problem. <laughs> yeah, that that uh, that does sound like a problem. Um, huh. Wow. Um, yeah, I saw I saw your wife uh, on Millionaire, um, and you were uh, the question. I think it was the hundred dollar bill. Um, was oh yeah, that was that was really too bad. You know, so. Um, what they did after she was on the show is they added a, a new lifeline where you can ask your uh, your guest to to come help you with the question. You know, I, I handled lots of hundred dollar bills in my work because it's like the standard currency of Las Vegas. Uh, <laughs> and so I would have I would have known that hands down. But you know, unfortunate that she couldn't ask me for help. Mm. 
Are you betting more, uh, like higher dollars now that you've like had this uh, um, this uh, windfall? You know, I can't really. I mean, like, there's, there's a practical limit to how much you can bet, and it's not. I mean, I guess for for something like the Super Bowl, the the limit is how many dollars you have in your pocket. But for the most part, you know, they. The books all already know that I'm a professional. They know they shouldn't be giving me more than you know a thousand here, a thousand there on every bet. And so there's the practical limit for how much I can bet. Now, if I if I want, I can like they'll move the odds, and I can bet another thousand or two. But you know, you, once you move the odds, chances are the value in the bet is gone. Uh, so yeah, the, the practical limits you encounter are such that the Jeopardy money did not make a huge difference in that regard. Mm. Well, I hear you saying that the, you've earned the the respect of the uh, of the bookies. Yeah, for sure. They, I mean, you know, their job is to to set good odds for the game. Yes, but I think that's like profiling the players, making sure they know who to who they give. I, I don't know if you ever read uh, the gossip columns on sports betting, but they'll talk about oh, you know, someone bet. Three hundred thousand dollars on the the Carolina Panthers this week. That that's you know that's not going to be me. That's going to be some guy that they they know is uh, you know not not the sharp money. There's uh, yeah you know they they'll, they're safe taking that bet from that guy and they're safe taking I don't know five thousand from me and the same bet and they, that's how they stay in business. You know is knowing the difference between those two. Is there a particular uh, like bet that comes to mind as like your like. Um like a, a great a great one that you really felt like you you got that one or um, anything oh uh, you know what well back in the day I used to uh, really specialize in uh, futures bets on baseball and the, uh, the first year I got started the, the Detroit Tigers were like I don't know 50 to 1 to win the AL and 100 to 1 to win the World Series I think like 30 to 1 to win the division something like that this was 2006 and I uh, you know I was just looking at the numbers this was the the White Sox had just won the World Series but they really overachieved that year so I think they uh, they were getting too much respect and the Indians looked really strong too but I think the and you know the Tigers of course were coming off this horrific run where they had just lost uh, 119 games a couple of years before that so I thought everyone was ignoring them and you know, I uh, they they had a magical run that year, made it to the World Series. They didn't quite finish the job, but that was um, one of the big things that got my got me started. Is I, I grew my bankroll a lot that year, just you know, on those Tigers futures. Are you are you a killer in fantasy football leagues? I uh, know. I mean, you know, back in the day, I used to win more than my share of them, but now the, uh, the the projection systems and everything have gotten so good that. You know, back in the, I remember back in the day when people were always drafting quarterbacks in the first round because they were the highest scoring position. You know, they, they didn't have the internalized the concept of like, okay, it's not about how much value they're delivering, it's how much value versus the replacement guy that you could get mm. in the eighth round or whatever. Uh, but yeah, back in those days, I would uh, clean up for sure. But you know, now nowadays, everyone has gotten good at it. It's you know, it's almost like a coin flipping contest. Mm. Do you still play? I, I do, you know, it's largely, I, I don't play it for money or anything, it's largely just a way to, uh, you know, stay in touch with my friends. I'm, I'm in a couple of leagues that are mostly people from Illinois that I, you know, might lose touch with if we didn't have these kind of things keeping us together. What's it been like for, like, your friends and your relationship with your friends, this this whole Jeopardy fame? It's been interesting. I mean, I, I hope that uh, I'm not leaving anyone behind you know I, I i still watch football with the same guys on sundays that i normally would you know i uh we have a i would not say it's a high standard of play but we get together and play rubber bridge with uh, my friends out here i don't know maybe once a month or something like that and you know i i i haven't traded this game in yet uh for anything else so i i, I hope i'm staying grounded i think it's been uh it's been an interesting thing for people to watch so you know to, to see this guy they've known for years uh, suddenly get this attention. <laughs> like, do they give you a hard time? Oh, definitely. You know, <laughs> I, what I, one thing I think is funny is that uh, everyone I know has their own, like, okay, James hasn't really made it until I see him in The Onion. And then The Onion runs a piece about me. They're like, yeah, or uh, someone wanted The Economist to write about me. I mean, the, the, the Economist, you know, what do they have to do with Jeopardy? But they wrote a piece enough, <laughs> surely enough, you know, eventually. I think uh, just about everyone had their preferred news source cover me at some point. So. <laughs> and now you're on the Setting Trick podcast. Oh yeah. <laughs> I don't. I don't think I ever got that one uh, requested. <laughs> I have somebody actually. There's a kid. Uh, 
David Yoon, who's like, it's a bucket list for him. He's a, he's a young British player. He lives in New York City. Um, he's, he, 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 I think he's a, I think he is a bridge pro, and uh, he told me that it's on his bucket list to be on the setting track. <laughs> so that's Interesting. Like, All right. <laughs> um, but he's a good player. Like, he's somebody that maybe will listen to the podcast, and maybe he'll reach out about playing. Sure. With him. <laughs> yeah. Um, what was else? Oh, man. Oh, oh yeah. I, I know what I was going to say. You were on Sports Center. That was awesome. I mean, like. Yeah, definitely. Was... You know, I, it's funny. I think that uh, Jeopardy has a uh, fairly standard thing they go to for when they have a contestant going viral. They, you know, they want them on Good Morning America because it's not the same station that Jeopardy airs on in New York City, which is a big deal for them. You know, there's a lot of eyes on it. And I, but I uh, was not. Not very cooperative with them, you know. I I like uh, Scott Van Pelt. I like Sports Center, you know. And this this program that airs at midnight on a cable channel was, you know, more important to me than going on this uh, <laughs> morning show with more eyes on it. So mm. it's, uh, that was that was nice, though. Oh man, that was great. It's it, by the way, I can't. Uh, I signed up for Hulu. You you can't. I couldn't. I couldn't manage to get any of your episodes. Um, oh yeah, they they're um, very protective. I mean, you know, like. Nowadays, the TV model, you know, without live sports or things like Jeopardy, they would be completely dead if they, uh, you know, no, nobody would ever subscribe to cable anymore if they mm. let these things go. So this is this is one of the big things that's they're protecting. Yeah, my grandmother used to watch Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy every night. Yeah, we were uh, we were kind of more of a wheel household when I was a kid too. Um, yeah, actually, uh, I guess one one fun thing I can. Uh, Toss it before we go. So I used to come home from school, and you know I was a bit of a latchkey kid. So I had until my dad came home to watch TV. And uh, I think you know in the Chicago area, unlike most places, we had daytime baseball because the Cubs, you know, traditionally play all their home games during the day. And we had daytime Jeopardy because uh, it was on at 3:30 there when most places air. It's you know just before prime time. So I kind of got really into baseball and really into the idea of going on Jeopardy someday. Just by kind of dumb luck that I happened to live in a place where these things were, you know, presented to me at an age where they normally wouldn't have been. So, you know, that, that kind of uh, thing just early in life. It's amazing how you get set on your path by these, these things that you have no control over. Yeah, and there was an article in the Chicago, one of the Chicago papers about you going to work for the Cubs. Yeah, they they uh, they made some overtures. I don't. I, I I can't really give you any information on my next step because I don't know it yet. But yeah, it'll it'll probably be something interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations on uh, on your success on Jeopardy and for accomplishing that goal. You really uh, you really are, you're an inspiration, and uh, it's it's a it's a pleasure to have you on the show here. And uh, I'm really happy that you're uh, that you're in the bridge world. Sure. All right. Thank you for having me on, John. Thanks again to James for appearing on the podcast. Um, please share the podcast with a friend if you think they might be interested, if they know James, but they're not a bridge player perhaps. Um, maybe, maybe they know somebody who might play bridge. Um, I'm certainly uh, excited about the prospect of sharing bridge with, with other people through this podcast. And I love hearing from you all. I love it when you tell me at a tournament that you listen to the, to, to the setting trick. Um, so thank you for all of your support. Um, we're going to start offering transcripts of the show. We did that for the first three shows, but we're going to offer that uh, going forward. And um, if you have a guest in mind, please email me, uh, john at thesettingtrick.com. And uh, see you at the table.